Time now for Morning Rounds with CBS News Chief Medical Correspondent Dr. John LaPook and CBS News contributor Dr. Tara Narula. First up, Zika vaccines. In the fight against the virus, researchers for both private companies and the government are racing to develop ways to prevent infection. This week, phase one of human clinical trials began for a Zika vaccine developed by scientists at the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research. It'll be tested at their trial center in Maryland. John, clinical trials just beginning. What should people know here? Well, this is an inactivated vaccine. So the viral particles themselves have been inactivated, so the people can't get Zika. But the protein coat that surrounds the virus is intact. Mm. So the idea is you give it to somebody, and it's the protein coat that teaches the immune system how to go after the Zika virus. Tara, I was reading that there's promise when it comes to rats with this vaccine, but is this the first human trial that we're seeing with the vaccine? So there's actually two other human clinical trials right now. The first is a vaccine produced by a company called Inovio Pharmaceuticals, and that human clinical trial started in June. The second is a government-produced vaccine, and that trial started in August. The interesting thing about these vaccines is, unlike the type that John described, these are uh, called DNA vaccines. And they basically work by taking a small piece of DNA and re-engineering it to put inside that little circular DNA, pieces of genes that code for Zika proteins. When you then give that to a human, for instance, then the human body cells produce that protein, the body mounts an immune reaction against it. This technology has been around since the 1990s. We don't have any DNA vaccines currently on the market, but there is hope for these two. And if they do come around, they're easily produced, easily stored, easily transported. It's a technological tour de force. And I have to say, for the Zika piece that we did for 60 Minutes this past weekend, mm -hmm. I I was actually there in August when the very first volunteer got the very first injection of this right. vaccine. And then a month later, I stood there with Tony Fauci, head of infectious diseases for the NIH, as we saw whether or not the tubes were going to turn blue or not. If they turned blue, it meant she made an antibody response, and we held our breath, and it turned blue. And I turned to Tony, and I said, what would you have done if it didn't turn blue? He said, I would have fainted right in front of you, John. <laughs> no <kidding. laughs> so are there, are there any other new developments, John? There is a, a bunch of other approaches. One that's really interesting, and happened down in Brazil at the time that I was down there, um, was genetically modified mosquitoes. So these are mosquitoes that are modified so that they can only survive in the lab because they need an antibiotic called tetracycline to survive. They're the males. The males don't bite. So they release them out into the wild, they mate, yeah. they produce larvae that have the same genetic defect, and then they die. Yeah. So this is an interesting uh, approach. There was a referendum just this past election day down in Florida to see uh, whether or not the local community would accept this. And there's still some controversy, even though the referendum uh, passed in the county, the place where it specifically was going to be given voted against it. Oh, interesting. And so there's still a lot of controversy about what are the unintended, the possible Yeah, you don't know consequences of this. Okay. Moving on now, let's talk about e-cigarettes and teens. Much remains unknown about the health effects of using e-cigarettes or vaping, especially when compared to conventional tobacco smoke. But are teens more likely to use regular cigarettes if they frequently vape? The answer, it turns out, could be yes. The Journal of the American Medical Association reports on a study that surveyed 10th graders at the start of a school year and again six months later. It found that nearly 20 percent, or one in five of those considered frequent vapors, became frequent smokers, and almost 12 percent of the frequent vapors became infrequent smokers. Now, I found this interesting because I think a lot of people assume that e-cigarettes are the healthier way to go, but if you're turning from e-cigarettes, then to tobacco use, then there's really no point. Right. The jury's still out on whether they are going to be a good uh, route to help people who want to quit smoking. But there are potential health hazards for those people who are non-smokers, particularly adolescents. When you think about what's in the e-cigarette, there is the aerosol component. That component in some e-cigarette brands has been found to contain heavy metals, toxic chemicals, carcinogens. The nicotine itself is addictive, can have cardiovascular effects, and effects on the brain of growing adolescents that can lead to long-term cognitive and behavioral problems. And then the flavorings that a lot of these e-cigarettes cigarettes have, they've been tested and, and are considered generally safe for ingestion, but yeah. not for inhalation. In fact, there's one type of flavoring that's been shown to cause scarring of the lung. Oh. Uh -huh. There's also a lot of variability in quality. So when you smoke an e-cigarette, how much nicotine am I getting? Is it really what it says I'm getting? The good news in all of this is that the FDA this year finally did step in and say they will be regulating e-cigarettes the same way they regulate other tobacco products, meaning kids under 18 can't purchase them. There will be a warning label about nicotine's effects. And hopefully better oversight about quality. But in the meantime, John, how prevalent have they become? Well, in 2015, 16% of high schoolers 
were using e-cigarettes. That's a tenfold increase compared to just 2011. In adults, much less, 3.5 percent. And, you know, as Tara was implying, the issue here is for adults, okay, it's one kind of controversial issue. Can it help you stop smoking regular cigarettes, which, of course, are so horrible for us? But the fear is that you're starting to use nicotine in teenagers and it's young adults. It's almost a gateway. Yeah. It could right. be a gateway. And also, there's some evidence that it could affect the developing brain. So mm -hmm. there's some real issues here. Finally, men, women, and memory. When it comes to the battle of the sexes, sexes who holds the advantage for remembering? I have a feeling I'm going to lose here. <laughs> as, reported in the so journal, as reported in the Journal of the North American Menopause Society, a study comparing middle-aged men and women found that women outperformed men in all measury, memory measures. I knew it. <laughs> but some of that memory advantage declined for women after menopause. Did we really need a study? For no, I didn't. Any, any of us I've forgotten what this segment was about. It wasn't, I, it wasn't emotional <laughs> intelligence. We know women are, are better at that. I did wonder if it was selective memory. Well, but you know what? Point. It's, it's very interesting because this two-thirds of the people in the country, more than five million who have Alzheimer's, are women. And it's not felt to be just because there are more women because women live longer. There's a lot of research into the effect of estrogen, other very difficult, complicated pathways, hormones, neurotransmitters. Right. We're just starting to look into this. It's going to be really interesting and very important as the years go by, and the number of people with dementia increases dramatically. All right, Dr. Jean Lapouk and Tara Narula, thank you both.